welcome back to Robo Replay, where today we're going to be taking a look at an iconic match from 2023 and seeing how even when robots break, they can still provide value to their alliance. So, for some context, this match is the third match in a best of three to decide who goes to Einstein's in 2023 from the Galileo field, and both alliances seem pretty evenly matched up going into this tiebreaker. Although the score says that the blue alliance is up in points, if we look at both grids, I would figure the red alliance is green in this matchup, due to the rule that three game pieces in a row give an extra five points to each alliance. And we can see that the red alliance is hiding the true point potential from blue by not completing four of their current links, which would end up being worth 34 points in four cycles. The reason that teams were using the strategy of hiding the point potential that they had at the highest levels of play was to psychologically affect the opposing alliance's decision making. If you saw that you were up by a large margin at 10 seconds, for example, you would want to climb earlier than to try to risk a late climb to confirm the climb points, which in your mind, you'd be essentially confirming the match. But by adding all these points at the end, you're taking away that confirmation that you're winning the match by climbing, so you're making it risky for the opposing alliance to climb early and try to be safe with their decision making. So, back to this match specifically. What's going to end up happening is that 1678, one of the best scoring robots in the world, is going to end up crashing on their alliance partner and breaking their collector, which is essentially they're going to become useless for scoring points until the end of the match where they can climb. So what we're going to do here is watch how quickly they assess every use case for scoring points from their robot. So they're going to go here and they're going to try to collect a cube, and they're going to understand that, oh, we can't collect a cube. Let's try again from this other cube. Are we actually broken? Okay, now let's go over... Let's see, can we collect a cone? Okay, we can't. So our collect is entirely not working. So let's just go play defense. And so their speed in testing their robot for collecting either game piece is extremely crucial as it's the speed of decision making means that you can decide what you need to do to help your alliance faster. And the sooner you can make the right decision for your alliance on what your next move is going to be, the easier it is for your alliance to win the match, even if you are broken. This is something I think all drive teams can learn to take. I think everyone who is aspiring driver, operator, coach should be learning from these top teams. So in this case, 1678 makes the decision that they're going to play defense, which has been touted as impossible by most people throughout the entire year in this game. And the main reason was that the reward for defense over pure scoring is not worth it because of how hard defense is to pull off. And a testament to this is that there were essentially zero defense robots picked this year, and everyone was rather trying to pick off of who could score the most cycles in a match at Worlds. So the first thing that 1678 does to play defense is they're going to put themselves in a position to receive a robot. And they're, by putting them in a position to receive this robot, they're going to cancel out the momentum that they're going to have while coming back from collecting a game piece. So we can see that this position pays off as 1678 is going to end up taking a big hit from 836, but they're not getting knocked off the robot, and they're able to have their flat side bumper on 836's flat side bumper and do a little dance to stall time from 836, which 836 isn't their primary target, so they just want to slow them down as much as possible before going on to their primary target, which we're going to get to. So here we see 1678 completely jump off of 836, and the reason for this is because the largest scoring threat in the game arrives to go collect a game piece in 3005. So 1678 is going to ram 3005 back a little bit because in this game, there's no leeway of trying to be able to use obstacles to try to give yourself time to react. So by knocking 3005 back a little bit, they're going to have time to react to 3005's next move, and then they're going to block off whatever they're going to go for. In this case, 3005 decides to move towards the sidewall, which is promptly punished by 1678 as they get knocked into the blue stub station zone and they get a free foul worth 5 points added to 1678 score. So something we're going to notice here is how 1678, even when pushing 3005 into the side, is keeping the flat side of their bumper on 3005's flat side of their bumper. So that 3005 isn't able to escape them by leveraging 1678 out. And now we can also see that 1678 is using the wall to advantage in a very similar way to 321 in 2024. So they use the wall to block off of 3005's left side and they're able to leverage themselves on the right side by tilting their robot, giving 3005 no option but to back up and take the 5-pound foul. As if they move forward, 
1678 is just going to cut them off with the wall. If they move to the left, they literally can't because 1678 is pushing them there. And if they move to the right, there's a wall, so they have nowhere to run. Now, 3005 does the classic swerve move of, if there's a defender, I should just try to spin to get off of them. Um, and to be fair, against most defensive teams, it's probably going to work. But this is 1678, and 1678 does the perfect move here, and they're going to spin with them while giving a little bit of space. And the reason that you're going to give them a little bit of space is because when you're spinning, if you have your flat side bumper on your flat side bumper directly spinning, unless you're perfectly lined up, the timing mishap, if there's a timing mishap in there, then their bumper is going to end up shooting you off to the side, giving them space to run. So by giving you yourself a little bit of space off of 3005, they're able to stay with 3005 while also having the flat side in case 3005 ever tries to run somewhere. So they're going to continue doing this, and it looks like 3005 just ends up stumped as they start to flo float around aimlessly. And I think that in spinning here and taking hits from 1678, they hurt their own module, which is going to end up biting them later in this game. And so they end up retreating back to their own grid, with what looks like to be one of their swerve modules that isn't working correctly. Now, with 1678 being sure that 3005 isn't going to make another play as they retreated, they focus on the other two red robots, which they again set up on the middle of the field to receive. So both robots are going to end up losing their game pieces here, so they're just going to wait for them to start to come back. And so after 1114 gets a piece, 1678 defends 1114, who they deem is the next highest scoring threat after 3005. And they're going to start to spin it with them again perfectly. So 1678's main goal here is just to burn enough time to where 1114 won't be able to get another cycle after this game piece. As 1114 scoring this game piece in an open field is essentially inevitable because of how much space they have. And they're not just clogging themselves against the wall. Um, and even though 1678 does quite well to slow down 1114 with the wall, they barely end up opening themselves in the opposite direction to what they did last time. Um, and giving 1114 leverage to get around of their defense and go score. And that slight movement that we see here is enough for a game piece to get scored, which is a testament to how skilled any driver who could pull off defense in this game is. Now, with 20 seconds left on the clock and a cube in the middle of the field, 1678's goal is just to deny this piece from 1114, as if 1114 tries to do a full field cycle, there's not really enough time to go get the full field cycle, score the points, and get the charge station points, which are essentially necessary to win this match. And due to 1678's off the side climber, they're able to sit on the middle of the field longer than 1114 is. So what 1678 is doing is essentially calling 1114's bluff, saying, we know that you guys aren't going to be able to sit here longer than we are, because we're going to climb from this position. So we are just going to deny this game piece from you, because there's no way you're going to go get a piece from your own substation. So if we just block you off here, then we've essentially won the game because we're up in points. We're going to have a perfect climb because all our two robots can go earlier than your two robots. And you guys need that game piece to try to tie us up. So we're going to watch as Len14 tries to swoop around 1678. But 1678 keeps their flat side bumper parallel with the game piece and 1114's position which stops any attempt from 1114 to try to snag the game piece out. And so the reason that they're having their bumper parallel with both of these items, and not just 1114 in this case, is because as long as 1678's driver has a faster reaction time and is it like completely slow to react to what 1114 is doing, 1114's going to have to spend time to circle around the game piece to try to collect it because the way that they collect a game piece is from a flat side of their bumper, as most robots do. So because they collect from flat side of the bumper, 1678 blocking off the flat side bumper and staying parallel means that no matter what they do, they're always going to be able to, well, 1114's always going to have to run into 1678 or go around and have to spend time to rotate and then go in, which is essentially impossible as long as 1678 is cycling and rotating with the 114. So 1114 ends up understanding that there's no way they're going to be able to gain leverage against 1678 and collect the game piece at the same time in the time left for this match, and they're going to end up going back to climb. And 
essentially what happens here is 3005's worth module comes back to bite them, and they're not going to be able to get the climb off here. And at the end, we're going to end up seeing a match score that is essentially decided by the climb. However, even if 3005 did that get that climb, the point differential would have been two points, which is exactly the amount of score that we, uh, Lev 14 would have had by getting that cube in the middle of the field. And if 1114 had scored that cube in the correct position, as there was a link ready to be made, then the blue lights would have lost this match because they would have gotten seven points instead of two from that cube and it wouldn't have gone to tiebreaker. So 1670's defense has been was in this match was virtually perfect and they ended up giving their team the win even though they broke their collector. For anything, anybody that's looking to take something away from this match, the points that I'd take away is that if your drive team is skilled enough, defense is possible in any game, but it is going to be really hard. So unless you're really, really, really skilled and practice it a lot, I would not suggest defense in games that are very obviously open field and don't have obstacles for you to play around. But as we can see here, 6078 makes it work. Something else that I'd like drivers to take away is how fast 1678 troubleshoot their robot and checked every use case in order and then made that decision of, okay, we're going to go play defense here because that's all we can do. And thirdly, just def defensive principles, using the sidewall to your advantage because that's always something that's there in every FRC game. And just making sure that you can always have leverage because if you're playing defense, the number one thing you can do is have leverage. And 1678 used that to the, its fullest and was able to go on to Einstein's with their defensive performance.